Today's episode is brought to you by Herdacity. Herdacity is a nonprofit inspiring confidence in women to achieve their professional goals. For resources, networking opportunities, and a strong community of women, visit herdacity.org to learn more. Welcome to Herdacious, a podcast for audacious women. Welcome to you all to Herdacious, the podcast for audacious women looking to make some career moves. And Herdacious is in your corner. My name is Lorelai, the happy host of this show. And today I have a very cool conversation for you. We're going to be talking about intergenerational conflict. And to assist us in this very interesting conversation, I have the energetic problem solver, former Texas comptroller, the first female ag commissioner of Texas, and recently the CFO for the U.S. Department of the Interior, Susan Combs. Good afternoon. Hello. How are you doing today? I am doing great. It's a wonderful day. It is. It is a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Always happy to be talking to folks at Herdacity. Yes. So, Susan, please define intergenerational conflict for us so we really have a full understanding of what we're going to be talking about today. It's a very interesting notion, and it's partly attitude, it's partly culture, and it is um, a disparity between what I would call sort of the bookends of the age groups. So intergenerational may mean it's generational differences. So you might have 20-year-olds having perspectives that are very different from 50-year-olds. And I had really never thought about intergenerational conflict until I ran across it uh, in my last job, and I find it fascinating. Um, and fortunately, fixable. Excellent. How How is intergenerational conflict different from ageism, which I think we're a little more familiar with? Yes, I think ageism is really generally um, described as a kind of discrimination, and it may mean that you don't get hired for something. You may not, may not get recognized. Um, it's because you are of a particular age. It's most likely going to be people older. You see that a lot. Whereas intergenerational conflict is you're already in the workplace, and you're finding that there are differences of opinion, perspectives, culture, experiences, and knowledge base. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you became uh, aware of this challenge in your last job. Why did addressing intergenerational conflict become so important to you? Well, what happened was I got to the Department of the Interior, and they had just done a lot of work on finding out what the uh, workplace environment was like. They'd done a big study, and there was something that came up that sort of surprised everybody, which was that of the kinds of problems that came up that 35% of their employees believed that they had been subjected to harassing conduct. That was not so much of a shock, not good news, but what was very surprising was that intergenerational conflict, people who felt they had experienced that, been disturbed by it, was 20.5%. It was higher than gender harassment at 18. And so that was totally unexpected. Uh, The work had been done to serve the environment because of some concerns about sexual harassment uh, in a particular place. This came out of nowhere, and the number of 20.5% was large enough that obviously we had to address it, had to learn about it, had to think about it, and I think it was extraordinarily eye-opening. Now, why does it matter? Mm. Because when you have a large organization— And really, this is actually true of any organization. If you have varying strata of age groups, they can be very, very different in their attitudes about a lot of things. How would anyone know if intergenerational conflict was a challenge in their work environment? You don't know until you find out. And I think what that says is for anybody in management, in their environment, you have to start assessing what's the climate, what's the mood, what are people's, what I would say is an old rancher, burr under their collective saddles. And so unless you do the data gathering, unless you ask the questions and you allow them to be answered anonymously, Mm -hmm. you may not know that these are problems. This was a problem that was not previously known. Why is that anonymity important? People don't want to be... um, you know, chastised for an answer to something. And so I think you have to have an anonymous survey that you can reply to anonymously. I think then you're likely to get more honest answers. I'm not afraid of being 
chastised in some way or another, mistreated in some way or another, I, as a manager, would really want to know. And I, as a, an employee, not in the management ranks, I want to be heard. And I can feel free to express myself. I am really sorry, management, but I don't think you understand how I feel about A, B, and C. And I'm going to tell you how I feel about it. So I think you have to be willing to do the hard work, ask the questions, and then the harder work of accepting the answers. How do you think this type of conflict, intergenerational conflict, can affect employees, specifically those negatively affected by the intergenerational conflict itself? I think it's a great question, Lorelai, because it's different. The two ends, I would say, get a different result. If I'm um, 20s, whatever, I've, I've always wanted to be in this department or this job or whatever. I feel like there's an escalator waiting for me in my future. I can get on that escalator and I can rise. Right. And I see another escalator. I get on the slower one, then I get the fast one. I have an upward mobility in my future. Well, I am told that maybe I don't know enough to even get on the escalator. This is what I'm, um, if I'm the young person. Mm -hmm. Or you're not smart enough to get on the escalator. Oh. Exactly. On the other hand, I may think that the person over 50 is kind of an old fogey. They're outdated. Their ideas aren't relevant to me in my much younger era. So that's not good. Mm -hmm. So I'm the older person. I can't seem to bridge the gap with these people. Um, they may be a lot more technologically savvy than I am. They may not. But they're not willing to listen to my years of knowledge that I have worked so hard to get. Right. And so if you can't have that collaboration, that communication, then teamwork suffers. I would say efficiency on projects which require more than one person suffers. And I think the older person may feel somewhat dismayed. Why don't they understand how much stuff I've got in my head, how much I already know, if they would just let me visit with them? Mm -hmm. Conversely, the person in 20, why is he or she always talking down to me? So it's really a matter of bringing them together where they feel they can actually have a fair exchange. And you really want a, a environment where you can fairly collaborate and exchange ideas. So let's suppose somebody new comes in. We're trying to get a lot of younger people in, and uh, we want them to get in. We know that we're going to have people retiring, but one of the things we have to have is we have to have an atmosphere of trust within the work environment so people feel they can stay, so they feel that they can be heard, and so that they feel that their opinions are valued. So getting back to the, the original point of the survey, when the survey goes out, if you as management pay attention, if you as management then reflect that you heard what was said and you say, I'm going to develop resources for you, you will be heard. You will not be ignored. That trust means, my golly, my opinion now has weight. I am truly a valued member of this organization. So whether it was multi-thousands, like the great Department of the Interior, which I think they did a bang-up job, or if you can get onto something like herdacity, and you can talk these things through. But in any environment where you expect teamwork, then you really do have to have the ability to learn from each other, exchange knowledge, but also trust that management is paying attention. When management starts to address intergenerational conflict, how can this affect leadership and management abilities? If when the data came in and it showed a lack of trust in management and it showed they don't listen, they don't care, they don't want to do it. But when you, when you do respond to this information comes in and you do address it, mm -hmm. then you have shifted that entire landscape of lack of trust, lack of confidence and gloom. There's mm -hmm. kind of a, a gloomy perspective. Why am I here? They don't care. If you show that you're, there's, there's both cultural and practical results. One is you have an increased collaboration. You're, Ooh, yeah. you're not talking past each other. You're now converging into the problem. You're converging into the solution. You also build coalitions around the mission of the organization. You join this place because you like the work. Right. Well, now I always feel like boats are rowing and there's people at the oars. If you're all rowing in the same direction, then you have a shared 
experience. We're on the mission together. You know, like the, the mission to Mars. We're in the ship together. We're going there. And the team approach, which you're now open to, both being participating in and being valued as, you can then solve more because I would say, unless you're Albert Einstein, two heads are better than one. And I really think there's a freshness to listening to other people. When you exchange that knowledge, you may be exchanging culture. You may be exchanging scientific data. You may be exchanging ways to problem solve. Or it may simply be a way of exchanging how to talk. And how to talk to each other is perhaps the most thing we can do as a team. Oh, my gosh. I love that. It's so powerful. Well, we're going to take a quick break from talking to each other. For our sponsors, we'll be right back. Hi, Barbie here from Moonray, husband and wife indie pop duo. If you enjoy the intro music, we invite you to listen to our WEP Honeymoon, streaming now on all platforms. Visit www.moonray-music.com for more. And we're back talking with Susan Combs about intergenerational conflict. Now, Susan, before the break, I had asked about the positive outcomes of addressing intergenerational conflict. How do we start to change our work cultures if intergenerational conflict is an ongoing challenge? I think the first thing you have to do is say management and concern has to start at the top. So let me tell you what we did at the department. Um, we required every single supervisor, and there were 9,000 of them, Ooh. had to take civil treatment for leader courses. Now, what I love about that name is there has to be civil treatment <laughs> lessons, and the leaders have to go to these civil treatment classes. And that allowed them to hear and understand, and they were required to go. You as a manager, as a supervisor, you set the tone. And if you don't require civility in conversation, civility and fair treatment of each other, shame on you. So that was done. But then once you take that step and you launch on the path of talking about change, you must implement it, you must follow through, and you can't give it lip service. It's about your credibility. And that is the flip side. It's really maybe the 180 degree of trust. If I don't see, I'm the lower level employee, I don't see any reaction. I don't see anything happening that I don't trust them. But if there are things happening and it is clear they heard and they implemented civil treatment for leaders and then they keep going down through the system, I think that is really important. So one of the things that was done in order to walk along that path was to show that we were going to do it, was to go ahead and set up and having classes on intergenerational conflict. But that was paired with something very interesting. It was paired with bystander intervention. Oh, so here's why. Bystander intervention, everybody knows what that means is if you see something, say something and help. Mm -hmm. Well, bystander intervention really applies across all forms of harassment or workplace strife or struggle. Right. And it's, it's enterprise-wide. It covers everything. And so if you could train the folks to really be brave and in whatever style suits their personality, intervene, we felt pairing that with this sort of outlier of intergenerational conflict was going to be a great way to give a leavening of the entire process. We had this. Everybody knows that sexual harassment is bad. You know, gender harassment is bad. They weren't so aware of, familiar with, hadn't thought so much about intergenerational conflict. So pairing that with the bystander intervention, we thought was absolutely a powerful ally in this entire culture change. Right, because you're sharing accountability and responsibility for good behavior, for civil behavior in the workplace. Because uh, initially we were talking a lot about leadership responsibility, top-down approach. 
And now you're saying we also have to look at it from the flip side, from the bottom up, because, you know, so many of us are witness to some of these challenges, some of these negative interactions in the workplace. We were happy to read in this original data that we got, which was that um, of the people who had seen or witnessed a harassing event, that a large number of them, like 45 or 50 percent of them, said they had intervened. Oh, wow. And that was exciting. And if you can assist people in being valuable team members to help change the culture as a bystander, you've kind of doubled and tripled your effort. And one of the things that we did that I was really happy with was um, the, the deputy secretary and the secretary gave me some money to set up Workplace Culture Transformation Advisory Council, and I chaired it. Okay. And I, what I liked was the name Workplace mm-hmm. Culture Transformation Advisory Council. And our first uh, permanent head was a wonderful woman, Tammy Duchesne. She did a fantastic job. The name was chosen carefully, Culture Mm -hmm. Transformation. Those two are actually really positive together. So with this Workplace Culture Transformation Advisory Council, we did a couple of things, and I'll I'll talk more about that later. But basically, it was messaging went out. uh, Everybody was involved. It was bottoms up. It was top down. And there were messages across the middle. And then one other thing that we did was we did... At one point, one other follow-up data gathering, we did we used a survey monkey for questions to just see what they were still hearing sometime later. So I would say you do your first data gathering, you do ongoing data gathering, but you have positive messaging. I imagine that was probably one of your bigger takeaways from this intergenerational conflict learning experience. What were some of your others? I think, first of all, you you look at the data very carefully. Then you look at the people that they're covered. So if you have very different groups, tailor your messages to the groups with their own statistics. Oh. So then they get engaged in making their own numbers better. They're inside with you. They're not coming from the outside. They're part of the solution. And I really think that also speaks to don't attack, encourage. Positive framing. Positive framing, I think, is so important. And But also, to hold yourself accountable, figure out, do you have a way to have some accountability measures set in place so you can check your behavior, check your performance? And you can do that a lot of ways. You may do an additional survey. You may do um, a survey monkey kind of thing. You may do just an anonymous questionnaire. It depends on how large your organization is. Hold yourself accountable. Check your own homework and let the individual groups also check their homework. And I would say one of the other things that I learned was that positive is good, negative is bad. Positive creates a, well, I'm optimistic that we can get this better. And optimism is a powerful trend builder. To dig into that point for just a second, You know, you were in politics for a while. You know how polarized this world is right now, unfortunately. Please share a little bit more on why word choice matters, because I can see that you're very intentional about this positive framing of how we speak to each other. Well, I'll give you a recent example and then a longer term example. And words do matter. Um, Just for this, I would refer people to go to www.moreincommon.com. It's a recent analysis of Texas, and are they as polarized as people think they are? And in a nutshell, the answer is no. When you use more generic, less hostile framing, it's, oh, well, of course I feel that way. Well, yes, and the middle swells and the outliers shrink. And this was um, sort of encapsulated for me in a phrase that a cousin from San Antonio used, and it resonates. No negative cha-cha. No negative cha-cha. And we all know what cha-cha is. We know it when we see it. I mean, it's negative words and just don't do it. Mm -hmm. And so whether it is in talking to somebody that's with this intergenerational, whether whatever kind of workplace sort of grinding there is, words matter and you must be intentional and you own those words. When they've left your mouth, 
You can't call them back. You can apologize, but they're out there drifting. And so uh, be intentional, be positive, and I think it brings people together. I love that. That's a really powerful way to kind of wrap our episode. To close us out here, give us a few more resources that our listeners can check out if they want to continue their journey learning about intergenerational conflict and how to resolve it. Well, obviously, herdacity.org is a great resource. Uh, and the reason I said I found it, so I'm kind, of, I'm, yes. kind of, I'm kind of partial to that. But the point is, it's a safe place for you to talk about it. And you can get advice. And you have intergenerational strata of people in herdacity. So that's a good resource. From the perspective of simply continuing the belief that actually words do matter, do go look at um, moreincommon.com. They issued the report here in Texas on Monday, uh, April the 26th, and it is fascinating. Their goal is to reduce conflict, reduce polarization. Go look at their website. And ours was intergenerational. But when I saw the work they were doing on More in Common, I thought, yes, 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 words matter, positivity matters, listening to somebody else, getting into their head. Don't have an attack shower of words because uh, you won't get through the rain, but, um, but pay attention to each other. And I think, of course, finally, the ultimate safe place for everybody is uh, to talk to a coach. Coaches can be so good. They have a wonderful third-party view. Um, sponsors and mentors, I like them both. They can be very helpful, and they're generally not cold-blooded. They're always nice. And then, of course, your favorite kitchen cabinet made up of whoever that is, who you trust, and whom you're willing to take you know, a little kind communication from. Love that. Thank you for those resources and for all of the information you've shared with us today. Now to transition to the end of our show, as we do, I'm going to share a fun fact for you. In a galaxy far, far away, there was a movie called Hidden Figures, which centered around the lives of three prominent female pioneers who worked at NASA, Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughn who were absolute brainiacs when it came to running the computers at NASA that aided John Glenn's 1962 mission to orbit the Earth, and thereafter on countless other space travel missions. Though Hidden Figures was Hollywood's take on history, there were several aspects that remained true to real-life source material, one of which was Katherine Johnson's unmatched brilliance in mathematics. Her ability to compute math equations longer than the Lord of the Rings trilogy, by hand no less, was indeed a truth to be told. Catherine was regarded as one of the most brilliant math minds in the country up until her recent passing at the age of 101 last February. Another historical accuracy in the movie was the emergence of electronic computer programming. In the 60s, NASA acquired electronic computers from IBM to increase accuracy of calculations needed in spaceflight. And the reception of these computers was not super great especially being very vocally opposed by the men working at NASA, as they believed their own human calculations were far superior to that of any sort of technology. Uh, do with that info as you will. Consequently, women saw an opportunity in learning to operate these computers, thereby securing future roles within NASA. Thus, women became the experts in computer programming, quite ironic considering the present-day deficit of women in computer engineering professions. Now, women shattering ceilings in the realm of space exploration has not stopped since. The following are just a handful of women breaking barriers within NASA. Way back in the day, I had Pearl Young. Pearl was the first female professional to be hired at NASA when women within the organization had been historically limited to secretarial or administrative roles. Pearl worked at the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. She was responsible for developing a highly successful system of technical writing and procedural development that would allow the organization to move to more effectively document their data and missions after she had noticed a lack of sufficient systems of technical writing in the organization. She became Langley's first chief technical editor, and the systems she developed remain in use at NASA still today. Next, we have Nancy Grace Roman. Nancy was an American astronomer who worked on stellar classification and motions at NASA. She's credited with creating NASA's space astronomy program and is also nicknamed the mother of Hubble for her large role in planning the Hubble Space Telescope. Nancy served as the chief of astronomy and relativity, and her work was so profound that NASA is naming a new dark energy telescope after her, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is currently under construction at NASA today. Moving on, we have Ellen Ochoa. 
Ellen became the first Hispanic woman to go to space in 1993. Ellen served on a nine-day mission aboard the Discovery Space Shuttle and in 2012 became the director of the Johnson Space Center, where she again set another milestone as the first Hispanic director and the second female director of the Johnson Space Center. In more recent news, Holly Ridings was named NASA's first female flight director of Mission Control back in 2018. In her role, Ridings is responsible for overseeing 32 flight directors of human spaceflight, missions to the International Space Station, and the Orion spacecraft. And women have slowly but surely been creating space for themselves within NASA. Pun intended. For instance, the first all-female spacewalk at the International Space Station was carried out in October of 2019. However, as with all things concerning women's advancement, there is still much more room for improvement. Out of the 565 folks who've gone to space, only 65 of them have been women. Out of the 48 active astronauts currently serving in NASA, only 16 of them are women. And women only make up about one-third of NASA's entire workforce. 28% of women are in senior executive positions, and a mere 16 are in senior scientific roles within NASA. Now, women in STEM and women in NASA might presently be the minority, but those numbers are growing, and we're hearing more and more about ambitious young girls and women working to be astronauts and engineers and inventors, ready to shatter more ceilings to claim their destinies, and that makes us all very, very proud here at Herdacious. There was a point in time when we thought it was impossible to send a man to the moon. And when we did it, we said, that's one small step for man. So ladies, let's keep changing the world and making those giant leaps forward for womankind. Susan, you have been an absolute inspiration to us today for all the giant leaps forward you made in your career and for the helpful information that you provided with us today. Thank you so much. Well, I, and I love what you were saying. I love the movie Hidden Figures, and the STEM is so important. Ladies, it's time for us all to take off into space. That's right. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed our show, I ask you to please subscribe and to share this show with someone who you think might benefit from it. We never know who might be inspired by a story from history or learning about a new challenge that they think they might be able to solve. We need all those problem solvers to come together. Until then, this was Herdacious. My name is Lorelai, and I was so glad you chose to join us today. Mm -hmm.